Welcome back to The Rake. Uh, we have an awesome guest today, an entrepreneur, um, a poker player, and uh, just an overall swell guy. Uh, it's Tom Wheaton of Faded Spade. How's it going? What's up, Jamie? I don't think I heard the word swell since like 1985, but very cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm bringing it back. We're trying to be yeah. hip on this pod, you know? Um, 100%. That, that better be in the social media description. What a swell, swell podcast. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so a lot of people in poker are familiar with you already. Um, your Faded Speed card brand has infiltrated a bunch of poker rooms, including uh, the whole WPT tour. So people are familiar with you, um, with your brand. But I uh, just wanted to get some background on you, how you found yourself in poker and what kind of jobs did you work before? Yeah. So I don't think the story is very uncommon. Like, you know, I'm 40 now, but at 23, that was the boom era, right? And I think like a lot of people, that's when I got sucked into the game of poker. And it was also right when I was starting out my career in the corporate world. And, you know, it was one of those times where the entire focus was just trying to build like a career, trying to grind corporate, trying to have as much fun and make as much money as I could playing poker once I kind of caught the bug. And for me, Poker kind of took the, um, how do I say it? it, kind of took over like baseball for me. Baseball was like my thing in college. It was the way I competed. It was the way I was social. A lot of friends came from that. And poker just kind of took that over for me in my early and mid twenties, where it was like, that's where I made a lot of my friends again. That's where like um, the passion to compete came from. And I just started out like a rec player, you know, that guy that was organizing the home games, trying to get the best cards, all that stuff. And it's like the poker kind of history and the corporate career history kind of transcended each other and both grew and grew and grew um, until it was like, you know, 10, 15 years later. And I was actually a pretty successful cash game poker player with a bankroll and grew in my career and built this like really great career that I was proud of in corporate marketing. Um and then all of a sudden, a lot of things changed, you know, and got married, had a family, a uh, wonderful wife, kids. The corporate grind became a drag, really wanted to kind of do things on my own. I was kind of tired of the underground poker scene in Orlando, which I was a big part of before poker became legal. And the growth in the game and the growth in the career just kind of paralleled each other. And that was my life for a really long time. Ben, did you want to ask him about his background? Like the actual background, not his poker background? <laughs> not not when you set it up like that. No, not at all. Well, I just want um, you to talk so people know you're on the podcast too. <laughs> but but people don't like that. That's not that's not a positive, Jamie. I'm gonna I'm gonna, gonna talk as little as possible. We wanna pretend Ben's not here. I love seeing the behind the scenes banter now. Because now <laughs> I can like go back with our podcast and figure out what clips you clipped out. Well, yeah, this is the big difference in my life right now. Like me and Marley were like not quite as close, but we were nice to each other. Um, ben and I are much closer, <laughs> but he's a dickhead. Uh <laughs> okay, so Tom, tell me where we are right now in time, because you're talking about poker kind of peaking for you and then declining a little bit. You're talking about the uh, corporate career peaking a little bit for you and then declining. Um, and... Where are we in time in relation to the landscape of poker in the U.S.? And what do you do next when these things are sort of on their downslope? Yeah, so let's call it, I want to say 2016, 2017, right? Let's, let's, let's say that whole high level background was from like 03 to 2017, 15 years later. So now it's 2017. The corporate career is going really well. The family is doing great. My poker playing at this time has like slowed down. So I'm not playing in the underground games anymore. I'm hardly playing two five no limit at the local card rooms. My bankroll from poker is gone. It's now like the family bankroll. And mm -hmm. that was where I was at. Like I had almost removed myself from the poker industry for like three or four years as like a player or as someone that was even following it. And then all those things started happening with the WSOP and a number of other organizations were like, and you might remember this, people were just fed up with the quality of poker playing cards. It became this like huge kind of story. And in the back of my mind, I had always wanted to get out of the corporate world, always wanted to start my own business. I knew it, it I wanted it to be about poker because it was literally my biggest passion and, and really skill set outside of career and family. And I saw an opportunity where it was like, 
man, wouldn't it be nice if I created this modern brand and created a really high quality poker playing card, kind of disrupted the industry, took all the corporate experience I had and just like pumped it into this business. And I literally had that idea in like 2012 to 13, but it was like four or five years where I actually acted upon it um, because I wound up losing my corporate job. And as a dad at the time, two young kids, married, house, mortgage, you know, I went from making a really high compensation to like nothing and having like three to five months of income that we could rely on. And it was an oh shit moment. And my wife looked at me and she said, I think you need to stop talking about this faded spade thing and you, you need to just do it. You need to take all your, your experience, all your passion and just do it. Um, and it was the kick in the ass I needed. And then it was like months of listening to Gary Vaynerchuk, developing a business plan. And then slowly but surely the brand started coming to light. But leading up to that, it's funny because those three to four years leading up to that, I probably was least engaged in poker as I ever had been, but wanting to get back engaged. Gotcha. A couple of things about that. So I remember this summer you're talking about because a lot of the biggest name pros were so outspoken about not feeling safe playing some of these high buy-in events because yeah. they could almost see through the cards to see what the suits were. And you had players saying, I'm not going to play the 50K Players Championship. I'm not going to buy into the 10K stud when like there's a chance that like opportun opportunists are going to be like trying to find an edge here and cheat and whatever. Um, and WCP did not act immediately on it. There's a little bit of irony in the fact that WPT and other poker rooms have adopted your card, but WSOP is kind of like, we just kind of fixed it with a different brand. Like, so you kind of answered their problem, but then they didn't take your solution. Um, mm -hmm. One other thing I want to say is like all the adversity and stuff that you experience in the corporate world is a nice uh, prologue to this year of COVID and how much you had to adapt and everything. And I don't know uh, if you have any thoughts on that. Like first, the WSOP thing, which is funny. Was that fr frustrating for you to be like, hey, I'm over here. I've got this nice, like thick plastic card. No one will ever be able to cheat with this. And they're just like, nah. Yeah. I mean, that's that's almost like a podcast in and of itself, right? But it, it's <laughs> such a, a funny story. But I'll tell you, I'm just proud to be the preferred poker playing card of the World Poker Tour. Like when I was building this brand and going through like all the marketing processes and strategies that I've learned in the corporate world, I didn't know if it was going to take. I was like, I hope people get it. I think people will get it. I think it'll be appreciated. And it was all about branding and coming out with a great product. And it was literally a breakfast with Adam Pliska, the CEO of the World Poker Tour, Dave Gitter, who was like and is kind of an industry mentor to me, Warren, who runs their partnerships. They knew I was kind of toying around with this and then it was going to be a real brand. And they flat out said, like, look, if you produce a high quality product, we think you can disrupt the industry. We think poker players and poker fans, professionals, recreationals, other businesses will latch on to this if you do it right. And if you prove yourself, we'll give you the opportunity to put them on WPT TV on Sunday nights. And when that happened, that was like the game changer for Faded Spade. And that's when at that time I was literally still hustling a new corporate job because couldn't live on the business yet doing this part time for like literally two and a half or three years. And I would say to people, cause you kind of mentioned that career transition. It's scary as hell when you're comfortable to try and take a risk or a jump into some entrepreneurial type adventure. Right. Fortunately for me, I don't know that I ever would have had the courage to do it. I had waited so long. I was kind of pushed into it. And honestly, like when you're an entrepreneur, and, and you know, the poker industry is full of them. Like it takes a lot of support to get it going. Mm -hmm. And, and whether it's me as a business leader or, you know, poker player, that's now, I don't know how the heck it's happened, but playing in like 10 K's from going from playing like one, three and two, five, you know what I mean? Um, when you have a vision like that, it takes support from a lot of people to make it happen. And I don't think faded spade would be a brand and be successful today. And I don't think above the felt is going to be successful without the support of the entire poker community. And I got to believe that's going to be the case. Talk to us about Above the Felt. What uh, what inspired you to start this? What is Above the Felt about? Um, why is, do you think it's important? Why do you think the timing is right for something like Above the Felt? So it's all Jamie's fault. 
<laughs> Let's just start there. It usually I is. Like start, <laughs> I, I would like to say, though, that we are going to edit that out of the pod if the launch goes terribly. And I'll be like, <laughs> I don't know what about the fault is. Why don't you tell us, Tom? Uh, this under- is Chris Moneymaker's fault. We'll just dub that over. <laughs> I get it. Whatever you're going to do to save face. Um, you know, personally, once I got back into the industry as like a player again and, and got in the tournament scene, and then the business side of it, I've made these relationships with folks. And it's people that I have come to really trust and respect, like Jamie. And um, throughout this time, I've kind of just personally used my corporate connections and industry connections to help out players and to help out businesses, like with new opportunities. So I remember, this is what, a year and a half or two ago, Jamie? I can't remember when we wound up getting you that um, booking with the Daytona Beach card room, mm-hmm. right? And it was so funny because I had a relationship with the card room, relationship with Jamie. They were looking to bring somebody from the industry that's respected, incredible, and an influencer to kind of uh, be there for their big annual event. But they settled and he, for he Jamie. Couldn't, yeah, I was going to say, he couldn't find anyone like that. And he was just like, well, Jamie probably doesn't have a lot going on. And he asked me and I said, sure. I, I sent a group out to like a group text out to like 10 people and Jamie responded. <laughs> I mean... You know, it was a really fun process because now all of a sudden I was do something, doing something for a friend, working with people at a corporation that I used to like have similar jobs to them, but I was acting as this intermediary and we wound up like working out a phenomenal deal that, you know, was great for Jamie, was great for the card room, was great for the players. And it was so funny. Jamie afterwards was just like, she's joking, but she's like, are, are you my manager? <laughs> and I'm like, no, I am not. You know, well, I like, just wanted that so I could be like, have your people talk to my people. You know, that <laughs> <right>. kind of. <laughs> and I was like, no, I'm not. But like, I've continued to do this for a select few, you know, people. Um, and then I just felt like, you know what? I'm doing this now. It's organic. It's natural. It plays to my strengths. I feel like the industry, um, and really, Berkey is is somebody that you know, obviously, is part of this, just like Darren and Chris. But he's someone that's helped me realize within myself that I can be like a connector in the industry from a business standpoint. And I think it just took me kind of believing that, hey, look, if I do something like this and get the right people involved, it can better connect our industry at a bunch of different business levels. It connect, it can connect players with corporations outside of the industry for like unbelievable, call them gigs or booking, special appearances, you name it. And then it can even connect players who... I would call above the felt talent who I think are the best and brightest in the industry with poker rooms and casinos and other organizations to all help each other grow. I mean, the talent that Jamie has and Chris has and Darren and Berkey, like this is raw talent that they just have and their influence is strong. And it's about utilizing that influence for the good of the industry. And at the same time, earning incremental income through their business side of their own personal brands. And I really believe if we do it right, you know, when we have these engagements, it's going to help put butts in seats. It's going to put heads in beds. It's going to create what I'm calling these positive EV experiences for fans and players that leads to great ROI for our business clients. So I really believe this is something that can like better connect the entire industry. It can give poker players um, with influence that represent themselves in the game well, a platform to grow their influence. And that's really what it is for me. It's just like this organic thing that started to happen. Honestly, I avoided it for a long time uh, because of being so busy with Faded Spade and having to pull that company back up during COVID, which I know we'll talk about. And it's out now. It's launched. The response has been great. And I just want to now see where this goes. Uh, And that's where it's really coming from. It's like kind of a purpose within me to see how can we kind of change the culture of the industry a little bit to be more like the sports industry, or even some other industries? I think that work is, uh, you know, so important. I think it's really, um, really necessary for the industry for washed up pros with declining win rates to diversify their income streams. So I'm really glad you're doing this uh, personally. Um, But uh, what is it like juggling you know, you talked about how Faded Spade kept you so busy that you resisted this for a long time. How do you balance having, you know, two businesses and a family 
and uh, you know, keep yourself looking so young. Yeah, he, he outsourced well. the family stuff to a bunch of nannies. Um, he hasn't <laughs> seen his children in six months. It's been okay though, right? They all hate me. <laughs> no. <laughs> what What's a great question? And like, what's so cool is like. I have more time with my family now and I'm closer with my wife and kids now than I've ever been in my career. And I've been married for 10 years. And when I was doing that corporate grind, man, it was like up at seven, out the door at eight, back at seven. It's really hard to make true connection with your kids and your family when that's your life. And that's a big part of the reason why I was like, I need to get out of this rat race and start my own thing with Faded Spade. Um, But to get back to your, your question, it's difficult and I'm learning how to do it every day. During COVID, Faded Spade, you know, we've doubled in growth every single year. We had this upward trajectory. Um, we probably lost over a quarter million dollars in business just on the B2B side during COVID that either we had in new orders or repeat orders. And that was a big chunk of change because literally 2020 was the year I was able to stop doing any corporate work and do Faded Spade full time. And then it was like, pump the brakes. Oh, shit. This is all could all like be gone. And I might have to go back to that corporate grind. Like my family is depending on this. Fortunately, my wife is unbelievably talented. She's got her own graphic design business. She contributes financially. And also like she's like mom of the year. We call her the the chief family officer. Right. But it was, oh, no. What am I going to do? And we I always had this like kind of vision to turn Faded Spade into something digital. And we wound up just like trying to create some type of digital community for people to get together during the pandemic to play their home games online and just Mm -hmm. have fun with friends. And that's how it started. And serendipitously, we got connected to a company called Morning Brew through a friend at DraftKings who was looking to do this big virtual, you know, fundraising corporate poker tournament, but didn't want to use poker stars or some other of those um, platforms out there. We wound up and it was just me at this time pulling off a branded virtual poker tournament with like top business um, minds. Like we're talking the CEO of or CEO of Twitter, CEO of Slack, all these folks. Uh, we brought in poker professional personalities. We streamed it. We ran a white label branded tournament. They raised over like $200,000 and we did it in like two and a half weeks. And it was just like, oh, there's something here. And nonprofits and corporations after that, ton of them got wind of it. And we just had a flood of inbound leads to do this more and more. And when that started happening, I pivoted the business to literally be virtual poker, focusing on corporations and nonprofits to help nonprofits fundraise, right? And obviously we charge for it. Nonprofits are a business, but they get like a 10 to 12 to one ROI, which is fantastic. And then corporations to like do client engagements where they can't meet in person anymore, something fun and employee connectivity. And that took off. And then all I did was pump all my experience from the corporate world into business development and project management. And through a lot of blood, sweat and tears and a very patient family. um, And now because of an unbelievable team that, that we've developed, this thing is is rocking. Faded Spade is a virtual poker company. It's a poker playing card company. And the team that we've assembled is really doing the day-to-day, Ben. And without them being as great as they are, there's no way I would have been able to bounce out to focus on high-level strategy for Faded Spade or even try and develop this new brand with Jamie, Chris, Darren, and Matt. So the balance has been tough, but it's like what I've learned and what I, I tell entrepreneurs, like you got to just act on stuff. You have to just like execute and sometimes figure out the rest later. And literally that's what it was in 2020 and what it is and and kind of probably will be for a little while with Above the Felt Entertainment too. We interrupt this podcast with a message from our sponsors at Run It Once. Today at Run It Once Poker, we've introduced our brand new promo, 30 Week. From now until Sunday, March 7th, players can earn an extra 30% direct rake back by playing in any of our SNG Select tournaments or by joining our 200 PLO cash games. For full details, head to once.run slash 30 week. That's once.run slash 30 W-E-E-K. And 
Over at Run It Once Training, you've still got a few days to take advantage of our Pads on Pads launch sale and save $300 on the most comprehensive MTT course you'll find anywhere. With more than $15 million in live and online tournament caches, Patrick Leonard is one of the most feared MTT players in the world. He's packed more than 87 hours of content into a course of over 160 videos that is only available exclusively through Run It Once training. Head over to once.run slash launchpads by March 3rd to take advantage of this amazing offer. And now, back to the pod. One thing that's like a really positive side effect, which uh, I really enjoyed doing is like hosting some of the charity events, um, talking to the people and talking to them on Twitch chat and everything. So many people have never played poker before. Um, so there are people who are like involved in charity. They wanted to do something. Their live event wasn't necessarily a poker event. Sometimes they would just have some live like networking cocktail party or whatever. All of a sudden, like they can't do that. You're not just going to go on Zoom, look at each other and drink. Like that's not really all that fun. Um, so they pivoted to having. Do you want to uh, change our Thursday poker. night? schedule jamie is that what you're trying to tell me <laughs> I'm, personally i'm wasted right now it's, it's a um no but they they transition to the virtual poker and you're getting a ton of new people into poker and we make it fun like that was the whole purpose of it it's like really most of the time the prizes are not um there's no cash prizes it's usually uh some kind of experiences up top or there'll be like some fancy wine or something. So people are donating money. They're not trying to really win anything. They're just trying to support a charity. And so their first poker experience is a super friendly, low stakes charity event. And then we've had people after those events saying like, oh, can we take this one live next year? So all of a sudden you're going to have a bunch of people who've never played poker wanting a live charity event. And then once they're in a casino, maybe they join poker. And it's a lot of women too. Mm -hmm. um, we had a Breast Cancer Alliance event where I've convinced a ton of women to um, punt a bunch of money into poker. You know, for better or for worse, they're going to try playing live poker. Um, and I think it's it's just good to give women uh, an opportunity to be introduced to it in like a really friendly environment. So I think that was a really positive outcome of you pivoting um, to the virtual poker world. Um, but something else, we've discussed this on a pod, uh, discussed it with Marley, we've discussed it on podcasts I've been invited to. Um, I think Ben and I have talked about this, that poker never, ever, ever pivoted from the people we saw on TV 15 years ago. Uh, it's like there's five people in poker who everyone knows. And no matter what they've done in the last 15 years, they are still the people that um, the average audience will remember and will identify with us as prof professional poker players. I think Above the Felt has an opportunity to show a different kind of person um, to the outward facing world. Like this is what our poker community is. Chris Moneymaker is amazing. He makes everyone have fun. Um, Darren Elias, just a, a family man who wins every WPT he plays in. Um, and Berkey, who just has a successful business inside of poker. I just feel like this is a really good idea to just be like, hey, we're not all the loud TV person from 15 years ago. There's, there's so much truth to that, to that. And, and honestly, there's a, I think what you're talking about now is like a, a foundational reason why, like, not just the business person in me and not just the player in me, but that 23 year old kid that was a fan, like that's part of the reason I'm doing this. Like when I got back into like being connected to the industry again, I didn't know who anybody was. I knew the five, four or five people you were talking about. And now that I'm in the industry with like both feet in, I think this entire virtual poker thing with all the corporations that we're working with, I think it made me realize like, not only is there a market for this in our industry, but out of our industry, but we can actually create and expand the market. And the guys down the street, right? Who we get together every, every month or two to play cards. They know Helmuth, they know Negrano. That's about it, mm -hmm. right? But the talent that you have, the person you are, Berkey, Chris, obviously everyone knows Chris, right? Darren. He, he's like Cher. We don't even say moneymaker. He's like, yeah, it's just Chris. Like, yeah. It's just like, it's Chris. But like, you guys are the best and the brightest in the industry. You really are. And I say that as a business person, as a player, and as that 23 year old kid fan that looks at it with that lens. And you should be as known as anybody that ever had their time during the poker boom, because you represent the industry well. 
you show people outside the industry that poker is not like the casino market. You can't compare poker with gambling. Like it's much more like a quote unquote sport. It's a game. It's not where you're putting your money at a table. The house is going to win. It's competitive. And we've got unbelievable bright minds. You know, Berkey, comp sci major, baseball player, bringing his own business to life. You, you were going to be a lawyer. You decided to follow your passion. You have become an ESPN poker commentator and influencer. Uh, Darren, who honestly, he shies away from this kind of stuff. I was surprised he wanted to be involved, right? But unbelievably intelligent, artificial intelligence, technology, business. There's, there's been no live WPTs for him to win all year. Is the right. So he's, he's, gone, he's, gone, he's gone like nine months without a win and he's starting to feel the <laughs> he's pinch. He's like, I'm used to cashing in for about 800K around now. He's yeah. like, shit, all right, like, time to look yeah, for a a sponsorship, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I should get a job or something. But like, like you guys, my hope is through Above the Fell Entertainment and maybe it's not mass market right away. Maybe that's down the line and where the company evolves to, but at least your reach and influence and the positive nature of the industry that you can show outside of it is going to be very targeted, right? It'll be very targeted towards certain corporations and certain businesses outside the industry. And then inside the industry, like the market already exists, but now it's like, how do we expand it? And how do we expand it for everybody's benefit? And then you think about online poker coming back over the next couple of years and how that's going to grow. I just really believe this brand and you and Chris and Darren and Matt being involved, it's going to, when people work with above the felt in any capacity, like everyone's going to win, everyone's going to walk away feeling great. There's going to be unbelievable experiences. And I got to believe it's going to catch some momentum and hopefully it becomes a little bit of a culture changer and hopefully slowly, but surely on the outside of our world, we can start spreading that, that news about our industry that we all know in it, but a lot of people outside don't really get. Yeah. And I think it's, uh, I just think I think reaching some people uh, in a little more of an organic way, like we don't have to act like not to throw shade at a bunch of people, but you know how it used to be on poker on TV is the cameras followed the loudest guy or the guy wearing a crazy outfit or a scandal, something terrible that someone did. Like we're on ESPN for Possel. That sucks. <clears throat> There's a lot of people that are a little more low key that do good things or that write funny stuff or that like when they're at a table, they're nice to everyone. Like Chris Moneymaker is one of the most fun people to play with. He'll be yeah. buying everyone drinks and he'll be like, we'll be betting flops together. And he just really makes people have fun. That's not like, it's not the loud guy, you know, it's like, this is a person who just everyone at the table feels like they know him when they leave. Um, and I always was frustrated that that doesn't get highlighted enough because it's not flashy enough. It's not obvious enough. Um, but those are the people I like the most, or it's like you sit with them for eight hours. You're not like, Oh my God, that guy never yeah. shut up. You just go, okay, I made some connections. And like, that guy was really cool. Um, there's, it's just weird that that hasn't been highlighted. Um, and that during the poker boom, I guess like anyone being loud and obnoxious was kind of entertaining anyway. But then yeah. after the boom, I'm like, people are looking for substance um, over just the loud obnoxiousness. And I, I don't know. I know I want to talk to Ben about that because I just feel like we have to be on the same page about that. Yeah, I think negativity really sells. So you get like the Mike Postle scandal, which gets a 60 minute segment. But I I don't even know that like, for instance, Dan Smith's double up drive raises millions of dollars every year for charity. Mm -hmm. I don't know that that's even been, I mean, like a little bit of mainstream, but nothing like the scandal does. Right. Uh, <laughs> I, I We really... I, I think we need to tell positive stories about poker. We need reason for people to be fans again. You know, you can't just, uh, you know, people still buy Jordans, but you can't go to the Michael Jordan well forever. You need LeBrons and you need Steph Curry's. You need the game to evolve and you need uh, new personalities for new people to become attached to. It can't always be old highlights in the old way all the time. So I think, um, I think it's great that you're doing some outreach with, you know, I mean, I, I would almost call uh, Jamie and I, and Darren and Berkey, like a middle generation of poker. And then there's a younger generation of poker even coming up mm -hmm. after us. And uh, I think it's important for people to have a reason to be a fan of the game again. You need uh, for, for the health of the game, but also for, 
bringing people some joy, you need to help people make those emotional attachments and uh, have a reason to spark their interest. Um, yeah. And uh, so I think it's I think it's great for the game of poker what you're trying to do. Thank you, man. And you know what? Like to Jamie's point, your point, uh, Jamie, you, Darren, Chris, and Matt, like your talent speaks for itself, right? The people you are, very high moral compasses. Um, your talent in poker is even outweighed by your talent in business and the other things you- Well, for me, that's it. not that hard. Well, true. Well. <laughs> for Darren, it's going to be hard for his poker talent to be outweighed by it, by other things. But for me, it's like, hey, if I'm uh, adequate in business, then wow, have I outweighed my poker talent? Um, I have to fight back against these compliments. They make me feel disgusting. Yeah, um, okay. Well, shut up. God, that <laughs> shirt. The... Change that shirt. What kind of color is that? God, Ben. <laughs> For the rest of the team, I agree. I was like excited when you told me the list of people. I was like, oh, these are people that I like and what I would want to hang out with. And it's a lot yeah. different from other things. Like, or it's like, hey, you might want, if you get invited to an event, it's probably going to be like a big name pro from a yeah. long time ago, which they have their place as well. But it's just 100% of the focus can't be on the older generation when like so many talented, cool people have come up after them. Like, why are they ignored? I don't know. And I hope that's a big part of this. And it's like, I'll give you some examples, right? So, you know, we in the industry, we forget that the vast majority of the people that make up our industry are recreational players and there's millions of them. Mm -hmm. And we forget that a lot of people at these card rooms or a lot of people working at corporations, like they see you on TV, Jamie, they see Darren on TV, Berkey, Chris, and they're fans of yours. But like, they're never going to be able to play with you in a 10K World Series of Poker main event, 5K WPT event, 10K WPT event, whatever. But for the, I would say 90% of the card rooms, let's just talk in industry right now. 90% of the card rooms out there, it's the $250 buy-in, the $500 buy-in. It's their biggest event of the year, 150K guarantee, et cetera. When that poker room can say and advertise a market that Jamie Kerstetter is coming to play or Darren, Matt, or Chris that is something that can build excitement for that event. It's going to put more butts in seats. It's going to put more rake in the box. It's going to give these awesome experiences like bourbon hour with Darren, three betting with Berkey, uh, poker boom stories with Chris, commentating dogs. and wine dogs and Jamie. dogs with Jamie. <laughs> like, <laughs> like these are experiences that we don't, we don't always think about, but that means a ton to the average poker player out there. And in giving in poker rooms and casinos, like internally giving their players those experiences, it's going to help them reach guarantees. And I always say like, hey, look, if you've got a hundred thousand dollar guarantee and it's a thousand dollar buy-in, do you think, you know, above the felt talent will help you like get 10 incremental entries? Yeah, it's going to. And if above the felt talent is commentating on their live stream or playing on their live stream, do you think that's going to get a whole lot more views? Yeah. Like people will know that card room exists. Do you think your players that are playing in the tournament are going to be coming back more and have a positive image of your poker room because they were able to have a half hour bourbon session and three bet mm -hmm. session with Darren? Like, yes, like it's all good. Everybody wins. And then outside the industry, you've done this, Jamie, poker teachings. People want to learn fun. poker, right? Yeah. Remember that? That's like, the most fun for me anyway, because it's like, I want to get more women to play. It's something that yeah. is important to me. I'm always trying to convince the girl watching her boyfriend play that, hey, you you could play. It's a lot more fun. You don't have to read a book behind them. That kind of thing. It's like with corporate teachings specifically, uh, a lot of the women that show up for them are successful type A women with disposable income. Um, and if they get exposed to it and they like it, there's no reason for them not not to try to play. I yeah. think a lot of the barriers that women face um, are not there for, for women who are already working um, like these really high powered jobs. Um, so I think they're a really good audience to target um, and they're very likely to be successful at poker if they put their mind to it. So that's something I'm really interested in. And I feel like we've had a lot of success with getting those women to feel comfortable playing a real poker game at a casino or putting a hundred bucks online and just seeing if they have talent, if an interest in doing it. Oh yeah. Like think about these scenarios outside the industry. I'm just going to go off the cuff. Like think about the impact of somebody hiring you to go to their university and speak to their radio and TV graduates about what it takes to not just transition the career you had, but grow a career in radio and TV, right? Like that's mm -hmm. purposeful. 
Think about Darren going to talk to an AI company about Pluribus and that whole experience and what that means for artificial intelligence. Think about Chris doing a special engagement with an accounting firm because he was an accountant and speaking to their employees about the similarities between accounting and poker. Think about Berkey going to a corporation or even like an entrepreneur convention and talking about how poker strategy relates to business strategy. Like these are all things that you're all, we're all equipped to do and we're going to be able to do. Um, and with above the felt, like I don't want it to be a roster of like 25, 30 people, right? Like I want this to be the best and brightest in the industry. And with you guys, like I know you're going to go to these engagements, like I just talked about, and you're going to represent yourselves unbelievably well, the industry unbelievably well, the company, right? And those, like that is priceless. That is what I want people to think about. Like when you hire above the felt talent, like you were getting the best and brightest and there's going to be an unbelievable experience and you're going to get your money's worth. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that's like uh, to parallel it to run at once. Like that's how people feel when they work with Phil Galfond. You're like, you don't worry about it. You're like, okay, if he's coming in on this project, even we talked about with Doug um, on the pod where Phil was the arbitrator for, for their match. where like, he's the head of a competing company. <laughs> the Doug and Doug was still just like, we trust this person implicitly. Yeah. And even if he had money on the match, they, they, which Galfon did not, but they trusted him anyway. And it was like, I think that when you have a team like that, when you pick people like that to work with, you have so little to worry about because you just know that they care about their own personal brand and their own integrity and, they're not going to do a bad job. I've worked some events where I don't feel that way about the other person I'm working with. And I'm like, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit. Like you really do just like, you have to over-prepare and be scared and I'm anxious. I'm like, what if this person's not taking it seriously? Am I now doing a PowerPoint slide? And they're just like, ah, fuck it. I'll just say whatever. And it's like, that that has happened. Um, but I feel like the team you put together, I'm like, I have no worries at all. You're like, who would you want to work with? I'm like, any of them. Um, they're nice people and they have their own personal integrity and and they want to do a good job with everything they do. And I, I hope that they end up getting more opportunities so that when people think about a professional poker player, yeah, they're going to have the old school people in their mind always. Like I used to rush to watch main event coverage. I still love those people. Like I have that in my mind where it's like, it's entertaining and fun and nostalgic, but I hope there's also another side to it where like they think of players like you have, they think of Jason Kuhn and Ike and like, People who have quietly represented poker very well their whole entire careers. Yeah. And it won't happen overnight, right? But we've got to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I feel like this is the start. And I feel like it's a great start. And it'll be just, just like any business. You know, it'll it'll slowly grow momentum. And the more times that people work with us, the more examples we'll have of results and experiences. And it's just going to continue to grow. And you know, the first year we all have the same expectation, right? We, we have, we're confident, mm -hmm. but we're also a little uncomfortable, right? We're, it's something new, but we're confident in, in where this thing can go. And you and Chris and Darren and Matt, like it just, you know, it just all came together so naturally that you just got to go for it. Now you could, you could, I could let fear, you could let fear, you know, stop you from doing something like this, but it's like, you really can. I do it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's so easy to just not do things because you're scared of them. <laughs> it's true, Ben. Like, I actually think you're being serious. I don't know. I can't tell, but like, it's true. It's yeah, all, all of true. all, everything I say has a kernel of truth and a kernel of joke in it. And <laughs> I'm never going to tell you how those percents work out. You have to figure it out on your own. That's why you're a good poker player. The, tr the trick was. is balance. That's why he was a good poker player. Yeah, that's right. I forgot. Yeah. <laughs> I was once. I was pretty good, guys. You might not know. Yeah, but there's some irony because his screen name was Never Scared B, and this whole potty's like, I'm scared. I'm pretty all scared the time. Because, yeah, anxiety disorder. The whole works. Really. <laughs> oh God. Um, I know Jamie well, Ben, and I've done podcasts and and used to host a podcast, and I'm pacing around my living room before this, going, "Oh man, don't say something stupid." Like. You know, it's just how it works, but. Oh, I have, I have no problem with that part. I say stupid shit all the time. It's <laughs> kind of my thing, but. It's his uh, brand. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, this has been awesome. Do you have any follow-ups, Ben? Do you no, want to make fun of me a little bit? I, I, I think this is, I think this has been great. Um, thank you for coming on. We appreciate having you on and yeah. Um, appreciate the projects you're doing and the growth that you are, uh, 
promoting within the poker industry. Um, I think it's, I think poker players can kind of fall into a little bit of rote patterns and not think about the bigger picture and not think about the intentionality it takes to uh, get the game somewhere where we want it to be. So I appreciate that we have someone like you looking out for us and, and in, you know, in a minor way, in a stewardship role, trying to, uh, trying to bring the game somewhere healthier. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. But it, it, it takes a team, man. And, and if in some small way I can help lead that, then I'm going to do it. It comes from a place of passion, man. And, and uh, we'll see where it goes, but I'm excited about it. I'm confident in it. And uh, hopefully we can change the game up a little bit. Sweet. Well, good luck. Obviously I'm invested in it and uh, I'd be rooting for you either way. I think this is going to be good for poker. And I think having some poker good news uh, to focus on, not like the sexiest podcast of all time, like Postle definitely, uh, you know, helps drive views and stuff. But I think it's important to um, not ignore when, when people are doing good things for charity and for the poker community. So we appreciate you and thank you for coming on the pod. Cheers, guys. Thanks for having me on.